evening. I'd like to call the Board of Education meeting for Wednesday, June 17th, 2020 to order. Can we have a roll call, please, Mrs. Larson? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Here. Mrs. Woodkowski? Here. Mr. Alexandrovich? Here. Mr. Lewis? Here. Mr. Gamble? Here. Mr. Sprague? Here. And I am also here. Thank you. And Sorry. Uh, the meeting has been properly posted. Please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For item three, I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda. Do I hear that motion? So moved. Motion by Mrs. Witkowski. Is there a second? Second by Mrs. Larson. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. For item four, we have community comment. Sorry about this, we're not used to being in this room. We have community comment. This is an opportunity for the community members to voice opinions and concerns to the board. Please limit your individual comment to three minutes. We ask that you speak into the microphone in the front, state your name and address for the record, and have a signed comment card available, which is at the front table, and place it in the basket next to the microphone. The community comment period is traditionally 15 minutes for all comment. We have a request that the board extend our comment period this evening to 30 minutes. Do I hear any objection from the board in doing so? Hearing none, uh, are there any community members who would like to speak? And uh, if there are, if you, you can line up to the side if you want to make, make the time go faster. But uh, but you don't have to get too close. <laughs> yeah, I get <laughs> Thank you. I apologize for not having more copies, but Priyanka Iyer will be emailing all of you a PDF of the full documents. I am Isabella Barnard, and my address is 10500 West Rawson. Good evening, Dr. Mueller and members of the Franklin Public Schools Board of Education. I am a 2019 graduate of Franklin High School. We are here today representing over 450 graduates, students, parents, and members of the S FPS community that have currently signed our petition calling for action. Before you is said petition, and to highlight the four main points, one, include social justice and diversity as one of the core, district's core values. Two, release a detailed plan for recruiting, hiring, and retaining educators of color, as well as establish a leadership position dedicated to equity and social change. Three, review the existing social studies and humanities curriculum to ensure that it contains accurate, historical, and contextual teaching on social and racial injustice, recognition of privilege, and diverse cultural perspectives. Four, establish a racially diverse team of students and staff dedicated to collaborating to complete the aforementioned steps. The racial injustices we have witnessed these past few weeks have led us to reflect on our education, and while we are grateful for our FPS experience and great teachers who provided us a foundation for college, we also realized that it did not prepare us for the vital and difficult conversations around racial and social injustice in this country. It didn't prepare us to understand the centuries of history that has led to the realities of systemic and institutionalized racism today. We say we want to educate all of our students for life after school, but we barely scratch the surface when it comes to talking about race or other countries or cultural backgrounds. We received over 130 personal testimonies from students who witnessed racially derogatory behavior 
with no action from teachers or administrators, even after formally bringing it to their attention. Stories from students who felt they didn't learn enough about important historical events and around racial inequity or black history. Students who struggled to count more than one teacher of color during their entire K-12 education. Students who have felt unsafe and unwelcome because of their identity. We learn whitewashed versions of history, literature, and art that don't reflect real life and promote ignorance and indifference. Why do we have two classes, world and European history, when they teach the exact same thing? Now, we are even eliminating the little historical content that has been taught. The middle school covers history only two days a week instead of five. We are asking you to provide us with the tools to be successful in today's world, to be truly aware, socially conscious, and globally minded leaders that not just colleges or employers demand, but that our community needs. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katherine Harris. I live at 8121 South 43rd Street in Franklin, and I graduated from FHS in 2018. I also have two siblings who are both students of Franklin Public Schools, one of which has been a student there since kindergarten. I'd like to discuss the district's history curriculum. After I sit down, another alum will, te will share testimony from current and past students regarding the history classes that they've had. I think the overwhelming conclusion that you will draw from these stories is that our current history curriculum is incomplete. Franklin High School's history curriculum lacks necessary content about the history of African, Asian, and Native Americans, as well as systemic racism. At many colleges, a course on race is a requirement for graduation, but not every student from Franklin attends college. Public universities recognize the need for this content, so the question is, why are we leaving our students behind? Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it, as we have all famously heard. Unfortunately, Franklin Public Schools is not committed to history education. Our middle school's history classes are disappearing. My younger brother had social studies classes only twice a week last year in the eighth grade, down from four. Parents, students, and community members alike feel that this is a shame. Now, when we first shared our petition on Facebook, there were those who told us that this kind of education should happen inside the home and that politics should stay out of our schools. I think this viewpoint ignores some harsh truths. First, racial minorities in Franklin get harassed constantly. We have a problem. Tonight you'll hear stories from a few people of color in this town, and you also have received a PDF of over 130 testimonies that we've received. After you have read them and listened, I implore you to evaluate how well education in the home is working in Franklin to combat racism. We believe it is the school system's responsibility to provide a quality, unbiased curriculum to combat ignorance. And it is also the school's responsibility to reprimand racism when it occurs within its hallways. Second, the conversation about more complete history classes is not a political one. Teaching the history of our country's minority groups does not demand that students choose between red or blue. It is about presenting long overshared historical truths of our country and community without hiding or tiptoeing around them. We ask the board to approach this issue with clarity. We have the power to make our social studies programs better reflect the reality of our world and better serve our students and the community. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, school board. I am Grant Eminger, a Franklin High School alumni of the class of 2019. And in high school, I often studied history because I cared about it, I was passionate about it, I thought it was important. Um, and in those four years, I feel like I've, I've developed a pretty good understanding of, of what's happened in this country and, and how we've gotten where we are, et cetera. Uh, but unfortunately, much of the most important information I learned, in that, I learned about our country never came directly from my teachers in the classroom. In fact, much of it came from external research or more importantly, just conversations with those, with those teachers you know, before and after class or before and after school in areas that they're clearly knowledgeable and passionate about, but, but are bound to a curriculum and a system that doesn't allow that to show. Whether they are guided by standards and skills that are brought to them to, by the district, or whether they have to teach to a test that's written by an external third party like the college board, I feel like students in Franklin are often being robbed of information regarding some of the most important people and events in our history. Uh, understanding that, I have a testimony 
uh, from a current FHS student who asked that their message be read, stating, when it comes to teaching black history at Franklin Public Schools, we are taught the bare minimum, that slavery is bad and segregation is bad. We are not taught the societal consequences of these actions that have affected life for blacks in America from that point up until the present. We are not taught about the many black heroes and heroines throughout history. The only important black people we learn about are Martin Luther King Jr. and Harriet Tubman. This is common knowledge. I feel like every year we're taught about the same wars and events. I don't need to learn the same things about the Vietnam War years in a row. Additionally, I have not had even a single black teacher throughout my time at Franklin. I've maybe had one or two black volunteer speakers throughout my time here. I feel as though Franklin lacks education on black history and culture, as well as exposure to people who've experienced systematic, systematic racism firsthand. As a student at Franklin, I understand that this could be the root of some of the closed-mindedness and different forms of racism that plagues our students. He refers to a plague. And, and in, in talking to, to staff, both you know, current and, and past, and obviously it's, it's not a group I can perfectly speak on behalf of all of them, but from what I've gathered, it sounds like this is what they want. They have, they have knowledge and passion in these regards, and they want a more diverse staff. And they, it sounds like they want to be able to provide a more accurate, holistic picture of our nation's history. And I think that right now we have an unprecedented amount of you know, momentum and, and, and public awareness and support. And I think we can use a forum like this to leverage that into real change. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Irva Ahmad. I live at 8001 South Lakeview Drive in Franklin. I graduated from FHS in 2018. The lack of diversity and depth in our curriculum extends past history into English and the arts. My first experience with racial education at our high school was the discussion of To Kill a Mockingbird during my freshman year. But To Kill a Mockingbird only offers one voice, that of a white woman. Our lists of American canonical literature are over 75% made up of old, white, male authors. The perspectives, of, the perspectives of black people and people of color in literature shouldn't be something that modern students just stumble upon, but something that is introduced and discussed in the classroom. We should not only read literature by Hawthorne or Dickens, but also something written by Chinua Acheb or Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and cover cultures and perspectives from all over the world. English classes at FHS are geared towards preparing students for the ACT and other standardized tests. The only course that portrays different narratives, multicultural literature, is not required, and the reading list of this class, which supposedly contains multicultural stories, are mostly written from the perspective of white people. Diversity in English and the arts must be introduced at a young age and continued through high school. These subjects are about so much more than testing. They are meant to expand the way we think, the ideas we are exposed to, and help us grow in deep, meaningful ways. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Trinity Hansen. I live at 3842 West Forest Hill in Franklin. I am a graduate of the class of 2018. I attended Franklin from kindergarten all the way up through my senior year, and I have a few testimonies here for you. A member of the class of 2018 wrote, while Franklin offered a source every once in a while with the inclusion of black characters or authors, these were not mandatory texts. They were a minority in a pool of white authors and stories, and if offered, it was optional. These texts need to be mandatory, not an option. Students need to read books that challenge what they're comfortable with and what they know. Given the fact that we are a school that is predominantly white, we do not need to read 20 books about white people in white stories. We live it every single day. We need multicultural literature as a mandatory course, not an option. A member of the class of 2019 wrote, there were three specific instances that I remember talking about racism. The first time was when we read To Kill a Mockingbird freshman year, and that conversation had little to do with race and more about the characters in the book. The underlying theme of race when it came to the book was brushed under the radar because no one wanted to talk about it. Since talking about race would have made us uncomfortable, we were given a pass. We shouldn't have been allowed to skip important conversations like these. It shouldn't seem like a chore to incorporate anti-racism into a school year. A Franklin High School teacher said, when we were being forced to switch to skills-based reading, a member of the school board told us to stop teaching content because students can just Google stuff. We teachers desperately want to teach content. A member of the class of 2020 wrote, 
We introduce kids to the idea of fire safety, of bullying, of drug addiction, of all of that from very young ages. So why is teaching them about brutal racism that our, nature, our nation experienced and still experiences not a priority? It is a problem that every one of them will either add to or detract from. So I'd say that introducing them to the concepts of racial equality, of the struggles and problems in today's society, of black history in America and the impact of their culture on our nation, that's all something that they should know and be able to understand throughout in order to take action. And all of this is necessary because this is America. We should be the land of the free and we can be if everyone does their part to ensure racial equality is achieved. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brianna. I'm at 2522 Winfield Drive in Mercy, Wisconsin, Mount Pleasant, Wisconsin. Um, and I'm an alum of 2018 class. According to the Wisconsin Board of Governance, in 2019, teachers at Franklin Public Schools were 97.9% .9 white and 0% black. Now, look at these numbers and think about what a teacher is and must be for their students. A content expert, a disciplinarian, a mentor, a philosopher, a therapist, a friend. In the words of a 2015 graduate, what do you think 12 years of white teachers sets up for students, particularly students of color, to only have white role models as teachers and coaches? What do you think that does for students of color that they don't see role models who look like themselves? It's about representation, end quote. I know I was six years old when I was drawing pictures of myself with blonde hair and blue eyes and stretching my eyes in the mirror because I hated that I didn't look like my friends. And that's nothing. Our lack of diversity hurts the well-being and equity of black communities and other minority students, leaving them vulnerable to even the most innocent of my microaggressions, ordinances, or even dangerous self-fulfilling prophecies. It also hurts white students by letting them uh, in their internal biases fester and deprive them of witnessing any strong, knowledgeable leadership coming from minority educators. Even outside of teachers, studies show that young children start choosing friends by race at around three years old. But by talking to a five to seven year old about interracial friendships, that can undo and improve racial attitudes within a week. Among our student population, we've taken diversity, what diversity we did have, and set it on a path of decline by phasing out the Chapter 220 program that intentionally sought to address decades of systemic segregation and redlining. Sure, some may argue flaws with that Chapter 220, and we know that any solution is not easy. There are financial stressors to consider and inevitably deeper rooted complexities to attracting new teachers and students of color that require nuanced and far from simple solutions. Let's persevere anyway. Let's address minority teacher burnout. Let's re-examine our recruiting and retention strategies. And let's do something more or different to make Franklin a leader. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Tyler Kelly. I live at 7394 Heatheridge Court, and I'm a member of the class of 2020. This isn't the first time we've been in front of a group of adults asking for a change within our FHS education. In my four years of high school, I witnessed the school silence a group of young women learning how to challenge the systematic problems that they faced. I've sat in a conference room with administrators telling me that my classmates' fear for their lives isn't worth walking out for alongside our neighbors. I've seen the school deny my interested classmates an opportunity to hear one of the most instrumental change makers in our generation. Despite knowing that we will receive pushback, we will not give up on fighting the racism and ignorance rampant in our schools until it is addressed, which is why we are asking that you please put us on the agenda next time so you can respond to us. While giving us the platform to speak may be helpful, we'd love to hear your feedback and see how you can get the real solutions that we have come up with as policy within our schools. Today, we had the opportunity to share a few student stories of over the 130 that we collected in our petition. Luckily, our petition has some simple, actionable steps to address the issues that we've been discussing today. Adding social justice and diversity to our school's mission statement would make it the beginning of our school district's commitment to being anti-racist. Hiring teachers of color will make sure every student gets to be taught by a teacher who looks like them. It will expand the perspectives of students that, are, that students are exposed to, broadening their horizons and preparing them for the diversity they will meet in their futures. This same expansion of perspectives is necessary within our curriculum. Appreciating arts, 
and accomplishments of every group will expose their, our community to the systematic racism that we see today. Lastly, we propose establishing a diverse team of students and staff, making sure that Franklin continues to be a safe place for all students to learn, regardless of the news cycle. Franklin Public Schools knows what it looks like to be labeled as racist and has tried to get rid of this label, moving to a point of neutrality. Keeping stories quiet may keep our school community out of negative news headlines, but it is not helping our students or community. Let's be on the right side of history and proactively ensure that every student feels safe in our schools and receives an education that will make them aware and empathetic citizens. We will now hear from a few brave speakers giving their personal testimonies today. As you listen, keep in mind that these are a few of 130 people who have shared their personal stories which we have provided the board with in their packets today, which they will also be receiving via email. Please respect these personal stories. Thank you. All right, uh, my name is Diego. I am uh, from uh, 3857 uh, West Door Drive, uh, Franklin, Wisconsin. So first things first, I wanna uh, address this to everybody in this room. I did talk to Dr. Mueller this year uh, before the pandemic about um, racial uh, um, justice in the school. And I did, and I really appreciated that and I really do. It was a great experience and it was a great uh, time to address it. Um, and she was ahead of the curve. Um, with that being said, I still need to um, address certain issues that happened to me and my family. So um, I am a Hispanic uh, American, as well as a Native American, uh, one of the handful in the actual, like in the registered Native American school, a regi registered tribe in Northern Wisconsin. Um, so first things first is that uh, I've been told uh, by my uh, peers when I was a freshman in 2016, uh, while I was wearing a Mexico uh, national soccer team shirt, uh, to build a wall, uh, to go back to your country. And I was like, I was very perplexed by that. and. Um, like, I'm like here, I was born here and everything. On top of that, my uh, brother, uh, who is uh, currently a sophomore back in fifth grade, was uh, heard one of, um, one of the members at his elementary school um, and refer to Native Americans as Indians, which is the derogatory term, and it's considered like the N-word to Native Americans. So that's, that really hurt him, and it hurt my mom, and she tried to bring it up, but she was kind of shut down. Um, with that being said, there was also two incidents that made the news, and we didn't really do much to address it except for emails to parents. Um, the colored and white bubbler incident, all we got was an email from parents. Um, and that made uh, not uh, local news, so it was pretty, pretty intense, but we didn't do nothing about that. On top of that, we also had an incident where a Racine Horlick basketball player, which I was at the game, uh, was made monkey noises at. And uh, it was just an email to parents and nothing happened from it. So I hope that this incident and my experience kind of opened your eyes a little bit um, to my experiences. And again, thank you, Dr. Mueller, for actually talking to me um, during the school year. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sana Fatima and I live on 6926 West Fun Drive in Franklin, Wisconsin and I graduated from Franklin High School in 2018. Alec Catarazzoli, who also graduated in 2018, wrote the following story. AJ wanted to be here today, but was unable, so I will be reading in his place. Hello, my name is Alec Catarazzoli. I graduated in 2018. For many that may not know me, I am adopted into a loving Caucasian family while being an African American male. While growing up and going through the Franklin School District, I have been called many things, nice, friendly, smart. People said that I have good character, that I am respectful and always have a positive attitude. That being said, there are other things that I have been called. A slave, a cotton picker, the N-word. People would pass them off as a joke or say I was only kidding around. Looking back, the worst of them all is the whitest black kid I have ever met. Or you act so white. Now old high school me laughed it off and moved on with my day. But after high school, after the things that I have seen with the treatment of certain minorities, after personal experience with social injustice and discrimination I have gone through in the real world, I can't look past it anymore. I can't look past the fact that when those words were being said to me, they were putting me down, 
They may not have realized it, but they were taking away from all of the positive words that were said about me. That just, beca that just because I was acting as what society says is white was the reason that I am being called respectful, smart, and having good character. And because I was black, I was supposed to be acting a certain way. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Liz Charowitz. I live at 3909 West Heatheridge Drive. Um, I just have to quickly say I'm surprised you guys aren't wearing masks. Oh, there's only one person wearing masks, given that all the summer um, and rec the summer camp programs were canceled. Just curious why you guys aren't doing that. But anyway, I'm a mother of a eight-year-old and um, six-year-old who attend Pleasant View Elementary School, and I'm here tonight to strongly encourage you to integrate racial and intersectionality of LGBTQ plus um, and economic education into our curriculum. I am not a Franklin, a Franklin alum. I graduated from high school in 95, but I was a women's studies major and I don't want everyone in this, all the young students to have to wait until they're in college and have to unlearn everything that they learned in school. It's really kind of sad that I'm standing here today as a middle-aged woman hearing some of the same issues I heard and advocated for when I was a kid and raising young children who are at the elementary school level when I ask them about what they're learning about regard of gender or racial um, lenses through history. It seems like it's really in the time capsule, isolated far away and not something we have to deal with today. And I know you all are public servants and you're here to do the right thing. I hope we don't hide a lot of the important information that is at students' fingertips that you can easily do. And one last plug to, I know policy is policy, but I really hope that the school board uses this opportunity to include all humans in their anti-discrimination policy. That's a starting point to trickle down in all your curriculum and education. And also as a parent of two young children, I think teachers need to have ongoing, I'm not talking once a year, but as part of the regular cadence to have um, diversity and inclusion training as part of their professional development. I work at a, cor a large corporation and it's just something that we have to do, they haven't done in their whole history. Everyone's getting on board. I think it, now is the time for Franklin Public Schools to get with the program. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jenny Lee. I live at 7520 South Sanctuary Road, Franklin, Wisconsin. Um, I have a three-year-old. He's in the early childhood learning program at Franklin School District. Um, I am a product of the Wisconsin school system. I was born and raised in La Crosse, and I went through that system and graduated from Central High School in 1998. Now, what happens when a school system does not teach everything about what it is racism against every races. So for the minority, it means that some of us just do not know how to stand up for ourselves. And when I was a kid, like other kids would, would just talk gibberish around me. And it was their interpretation of what a Chinese language is. And guess what? I'm Korean, I'm not Chinese. So it didn't, in my 20s, microaggressions would happen to me. People would walk up to me in grocery stores and say, ni hao, and I'd be like, what? I'm Korean. And it didn't take me until my late 30s, until I understand how to stand up for myself, how to raise my voice and say, no, that's not right. And even in my late 30s, I still had a white friend come up to me at my own Korean Lunar New Year party and say, Happy New Year in Chinese to me. That was true in ignorance, and I talked to my friend about it. But the thing is, like in my 20s, like I didn't even know how to even broach the topic of racism or even to talk to friends on, you know, how to work out those situations. And I had to figure it out on my own because my parents didn't want to talk about race. Like they would just say, you got to let it go. We gotta, we gotta be perfect as minorities, we gotta be perfect as Asian, 
You gotta get straight A's. You gotta become a valedictorian. You gotta get into an Ivy League school, which I did. And I'm asking you to listen to these high school alumni of this district and understand that teaching something about racism, about Native Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans, LGBTQ, and help them work through those issues of like, if something happens to them, to teach them how to stand up for themselves and how to teach white students to be allies to their friends, to their minority friends. And that is why I am speaking today. So I'm asking you to consider what these students or alumni have said in their petition because it is so important, because it took me so long to figure out how to raise my voice, and I am doing that now. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Katie Smith. My address is 11800 West Forest Home Avenue in Franklin, and I am an alum from Franklin High School of 2015. Um, what's fortunate about that is uh, I'm ashamed to say I ever attended Franklin Public Schools. Throughout my time at Franklin, I was bullied and belittled for several reasons, but the reason that stung the most was because I am different and it's not something I can change. The easiest way to explain this is to be blunt. My mother was a poor alcoholic who didn't make time for me when I was growing up. My father was an irresponsible druggie. My mother is white and my father is a black native. I am not expressing this to show stereotypes, but rather to make the unapparent obvious. It is important to note this because of how I grieved while attending your school district. The majority of my family is black and those are the people I grew up around. You can't begin to imagine what I felt like going to a predominantly white school. I hung out with a small but strong black community within this district because they understood and accepted me the most. But outside of those people, I felt conflicted. As a black and native person with white privilege, I still felt like I was being treated unfairly. For example, while I was attending this school district, my older brother was shot 16 times in cold blood, but he died a brave black man. The days following his murder, several students had seen him make the news, and they spit jokes back and forth about another black man dying. When I confronted them and your staff was made aware about the situation, the person that got in trouble was me. I don't think you would believe me when I say I have encountered more situations at this school district that are worse than that. And you cannot even fathom the stories of the visibly black and brown students' past and present experience. The situation today is a little too familiar for me. When I was in middle school at Forest Park, I stood in this exact spot, well, actually, the older building, um, standing in front of the school board, proclaiming very similar thoughts and ideas. What's funny is I have come full circle. I was pretty nervous back then, but fast forward over a decade later, and I am outraged. I am outraged that racism is prevalent in this school district, and there is no consequence for it. I am outraged for the black and brown youth that go to Franklin Public Schools and have a negative connotation for themselves being different. If there's anything you take away from this speech I have given today, let it be the examples of things I would like to change. I would like to suggest a more diverse staff for diverse student body, including black and brown counselors, so that black and brown students feel welcomed. After witnessing police brutality my black native father endured, I bottled my emotions because I didn't feel, talk didn't feel comfortable talking to somebody who wouldn't understand and to stop using prison labor for bigger printing jobs that the school district has because it's cheaper. This is modern day slavery still allowed under the constitutional clause and detrimental to harmful stereotypes kids learn. And lastly, to invest in diversity and inclusion in classrooms with more accurate US history taught, including social and racial injustices, which leads to an extensive mandatory black and brown um, history taught by black and native teachers because I never wanted to learn the lies and fake histories of my ancestors talked taught by somebody who doesn't walk the same path as me. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brian McKee, 8453 West Cold Spring Road. And I will not say what year I graduated, uh, but I stand before you uh, today. I was invited by Trinity uh, after speaking at the, the protest last week. So not only do I have uh, friends and those that I consider family uh, in the Franklin area, but I have a connection here because uh, of some of my colleagues. I am a, a local pastor of a multi-ethnic church, and 
my history with racism and social injustice goes back to kindergarten when one of my kindergarten teachers decided that she would like to kick the African-American kids in the class. When I didn't understand this and went home and asked my mom, why is my teacher kicking me? Oh, my mom was livid. And she went to the school to uh, address this situation only to find out that it was the African-American kids only that this teacher was, was kicking. Uh, fast forward now to high school from being a, a great student as a matter of fact, all throughout my years in high school, I was on the honor roll, but still being called the N-word, being threatened of being lynched in the suburbs uh, to many other things that were very traumatic to my well-being. I understand that it is important for students to understand not only the history of America, but also understand how they can stand up for what is just and what is right. Being a multi-ethnic church pastor, it allows me the opportunity with a diverse congregation to have these conversations, to be able to talk about the various cultural nuances and particular things that I can adjust to and our community needs to adjust to in order for our country to be one where everyone understands that they are treated as human beings and that they live in an equitable society. In addition to that, I am a cross-cultural competence professional, and I also, not only in religious, but in non-religious spaces, help schools, help organizations, help businesses to form organizations that are equitable. So I stand here not only with personal experience, but also have putting in the work to let you all know that it is vitally important for there to be education in your school system that addresses racial inequities and also social justice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Shannon Smith. I live at 6646 West Charles Court. And uh, I just have a few things I want to share with you. I think, uh, hi, Dr. Mueller. I think uh, representation is important. And so today, I took time out of my schedule to represent. And I thought it important that I brought my two sons here. Richard is a high school graduate from last year, and Mason is headed into the eighth grade. And I want to tell you some of my experiences real quick. I think we have one of the greatest school districts. We certainly have all the resources. And man, this is the best building for a school I've ever seen in my life. But what shames me is that my son graduated high school thinking this was the worst place he ever could have went to school. He was super excited when he got to the high school he joined the football team. He was super excited about that until some of the team members attempted to haze him. He went on, and, and I, I don't intend to embarrass him. I don't think I meant to tell these stories when I brought him here, but you have to speak the truth if you want real change. He went on a field trip to Harvest for Humanity, and he came home angry, and he said some of the students told him, this is just like picking cotton, ain't it? And on another occasion, he comes home, and he's got this look on his face that I'd never seen before. It looks like he's going to kill someone. And he says, someone on the school bus called him the N-word. Happened to be someone that lived right on the, you know, down the corner, on, on the corner of my street. Went and talked to his parents. And so, the stories that you're hearing today are not just timely, because this is the moment. This stuff is real, but we're asking for your help. We're asking for you to pay attention and listen. And the only thought I had while I was waiting in line, listening to the alumni and all these young people, I really want to cry. I really want to cry for the stories that they had to share with you. 
And I understand that this format doesn't allow a back and forth. We weren't on the agenda. You guys just get to listen. And I understand that a lot has been said today. But I want to tell you, having a $66 million building doesn't mean squat if your students leave here thinking this was a terrible place to come. And I know you have a lot of good people in these buildings, and I know there's a lot of good people here, and I know that you're trying to do the right things. But the message you're getting today from everyone is we haven't done enough, and so far we're failing. And I've seen many of my black friends pull their kids out of the district. That was saddening. I too have contemplated whether my younger son should go to the high school. That's very saddening. I'm here because not only am I one of your harshest critics online, but I also take time to email your superintendent when I see someone in the, t in the district or one of the teachers doing good or getting praise. I make sure that she sees that too. Not only am I here to complain, I guess it's what I would call it, but I'm also here to remind you that I'm here to help. I will take the call, I will show up at the meeting, I will clear my schedule and strap up my boots. But right now, I just feel this inner pain that I had for my kids, that I have for what's going on socially around the world. But standing in that line, I just wanted to cry listening to these folks. And so, I just want to take a second. I'm talking real slow because I really want it to sink in. You do have a problem. The posted notes for the whites and coloreds, people being called the N-word. But think about this for a second. I'm not sure you got three students in the high school that can tell you what happened in Selma. Can all of our high school students tell us who Rosa Parks is? Can everyone in our high school tell us about the I Had a Dream speech? If they can't, we have certainly failed on educating black history. I was disappointed a few years ago when we were the only school district that did not shut down for Dr. King's holiday. I think we rectified that. It's progress. Much more needs to be done. Just think about that. How many of our students can tell us about the I Had a Dream speech? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ashley. I'm at 7830 South 66 Street in Franklin. I just wanted to read an email that I sent to Mrs. King as well as you. Just wanted to inform you of an incident that happened with my son, Cameron, and it rubbed me the wrong way. And it also upset Cameron. He has come home on multiple occasions and told me about some racist remarks his friends have said to him on the bus and at school. The latest incident, I didn't appreciate it all. A boy asked Cameron what material was his sweatshirt made of. If you all knew my son, you would understand his response. He said, duh, it's cotton. So the kid asked him, did he pick it himself? How disgusting, insensitive, rude, and unaware of how such remarks can make a person feel. Regardless of color, he's still a person and a kid with feelings that were disrupted. I would like for you to speak to Cameron about the incident and get to the bottom of it. If I need to be present, just let me know. I could be the parent to have Cameron say some racist remarks back or tell him 
that kid deserves a punch in the face. I'm not that parent. I trust the school officials will handle it. If not, it will only get worse. And that was in March, and this is June, so it did get worse. As far as the insensitivity of the constant remarks, I believe the school district as a whole should make some kind of effort to bring African American history as well as other ethnic history into the school curriculum. It will teach the kids that these disgusting things that they're saying to their friends are not cool, like it hurts them. They might not say it to the kids, to their friends, but they go home and tell their parents, and then their parents feel a certain way for their kid. I have six kids all together. All of them are black, four are boys. Jalen, he's Franklin High School. He's a junior. Many stories of things that go on in the high school. My daughter just left the middle school, and she's in the high school. Like some said, it's embarrassing, and it's not like, oh, my kid goes to Franklin, my kid goes to, no. Coming from Milwaukee Public School to here, it looks nice, it's just the outside. But once you get on the inside, it's different. I'm not saying that everyone is bad, and I'm not saying everyone is good, but, don't know if you heard of her. Her name is Jane Elliott. She said, on a black-eyed, brown-eyed, experiment on the Oprah show in 1992, the only thing necessary for the perpetuation of evil is for the good people to do nothing. I think it's a lot of good people and they're doing nothing. You sweep the history under the rug and you just continue to go, whether it's blocked or you don't have room for that type of history, it needs to happen because people don't know. Dr. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, just scratch of the surface. There's more to happen beneath them. Like, it's a lot of stuff that needs to be said. To kill a mockingbird, what about other history? Something, something. I was saddened, tears in my eyes, listening to Katie's story about how she was treated. My daughter is the same way, and her name is Katie. She gets picked on all the time because she's not like everyone else. She's mixed, black and white. Is she confused? She might be, but she doesn't fit anywhere. It's terrible for kids to come up that way and they don't have allies to go to, whether it's at school or it's at home. As a parent, you're limited to what you can do. You can go to the school and talk to whoever, but what's gonna be done? Ms. King said she'll figure out what she can do. This email was sent to you guys March 20th, 2020. I just thought you should know. Thank you. Um, hello, so I am a student at FHS. Oh. My name is Shreya Panati, and I live at 4188 West 53th Drive. So I'm graduating 2022, and FHS has problems. Like, as a student there, it started from kindergarten. I remember one night, I asked my mom why I was getting certain comments, and I was just told I had to ignore it, because that's what's been happening since I was young. You know, I have to ignore it. Because if I, you know, if I really push at it, then other students, it makes them uncomfortable, you know? I have to say, oh, that's a funny joke when they insult my culture. And I have to laugh along with it because if I don't, if I don't, then I'm seen as the one who's wrong. And so what's thrown in FHS, you don't see straight up discrimination, like straight up blatant racism directed at kids but it's ignorance, it's just ignorance. They don't know about other cultures. The idea of being American means you have to whitewash yourself. And that's something that, that's never changed, that's something that's never improved because it's the culture that's bred in Franklin. 
it's the culture that's bred in the school because no one's available to talk about what's really happening. You have to just stand there and watch as if kids laugh at you, you have to laugh with them. You don't have a choice at that point because you can't make them uncomfortable if you're the minority. And that's what's been pushed. I think what Franklin has to do is start from a young age. They have to introduce the idea that America is supposed to be the land of diversity and freedom. And they have to be introduced to the idea of the other cultures of what other people have faced because of their skin color and because of what they've been forced to experience in a country that's honestly been built on discrimination, on the removal of indigenous lands, on segregation, on the Jim Crow laws, on black codes. You have to address all that from a young age. It's not an uncomfortable topic. It's part of our history. If we can address George Washington and his brilliance, we can address his slave, slave owning side. We can address what came before the Civil War, what came after the Civil War, what came before Martin Luther King. We have to address what happened in America that's made us come to this point in history. It's important to build that from a young age because there is no use in trying to change it now. You have to introduce it to a new generation of kids. You have to try and make change from the core of our system because it's something that's been built into America. So please, please, thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Nadia Serrada, and I live at 4829 West Indiana. Whether we as students want to admit it or not, a lot of what we learn in school is what we take into the rest of our lives. Learning about diversity and inclusivity can't just be pushed off into clubs or electives, because otherwise only a small group of people will be exposed to it. It needs to be implemented into our essential classes that everyone takes. It's too important to be ignored, and it's imperative for everyone to learn about it. From this, I want students to take that information and apply it into their lives, to change their ignorant and closed-minded beliefs, because ignorance becomes an issue when nothing is done to change it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Veronica Estrada. I am Nadia, just folks mom. I have five beautiful children that attend Franklin High School, or I attend Franklin Schools, three in high school, two in the elementary. Um, I'm gonna be a little bit verbose because as my kids know, I, everything I say is a lesson or a lecture. So, um, a legacy is defined as the story of our life. The things we did, places we went, goals we accomplished, our failures and transgressions left behind to be remembered by and learned from. It is the sum of them all, not one piece individually. So I ask, who are we without our stories? Do we exist? Are we of value? Did we make an impact in this world that we all share together? Will anything we did make a difference in our children? About a year and a half ago, my husband and the father of my beautiful children um, came to, uh, well, not this school, the old school, uh, the middle school to speak to my daughter's eighth grade class on immigration and citizenship. They were learning about that and we were all elated to see that. Um, he was being interviewed by students on the process and reasons for why his family uh, chose to immigrate to this country. Uh, while waiting for his next student and in the process, um, a member of the school board, and this is what I'd like you guys to reflect on, a member of the school board approached him and asked him um, why it is that some immigrants feel that uh, they have to say either uh, Bolivian, in his case, he's from Bolivia, I come from Mexican ancestors, but was born and raised here, from uh, Bolivian American, or Mexican American, or Indian American, because that person's ancestors immigrated here as well, but never felt the need to. She, this person stated it with a little bit of disdain, so of course, we're gonna take it as we don't belong, we don't feel welcome here. 
And it's a story that is repeated a lot of times in our schools. And what I find, it's not the students that are to blame. It is us, the adults. We need to create an environment where everybody is welcome and open to share their stories. Because it is in those stories and in those minute connections that we learn about each other, that we can break bread together, that we can respect one another. If we don't talk about diversity, if we don't include everybody, where are we as a school? Where are we as a community? We cannot keep talking about not bullying, not doing this, and scolding our children for this and that, and not include racism and diversity in that conversation. It is important, and it begins with us. And that's what I would like for you guys to take. It's not somewhere far off. It starts here with you guys and the curriculum that we teach in our schools and our children take home to their families. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jacob Malinowski. I live at 5684 Oakwood Street in Greendale. I graduated from Greendale in 2016. Was not planning on speaking here tonight, uh, but I wanted to touch on two very important things. Uh, the first of which is engagement. Uh, I'm so proud of all of the young people uh, and other folks who spoke tonight and engaged with the board. This is a very scary thing for you all to do, so I want to congratulate all of you for doing so. And flip that engagement on its head. On March 2nd, I emailed every single member of this board uh, as a candidate for public office to engage with you. Uh, one of them responded, that was Mike. I would like to recognize that right now. Mike and I did not agree on everything, but we sat down for coffee in Greendale and talked about it for an hour. That sort of engagement goes on right across the street in Greendale. That sort of engagement is important. Uh, and so I encourage you to engage with the young folks here who are trying to see a change in the schools that they care about. The second thing I would like to do is preempt a concern I expect to hear, because I've heard it from board members before. And that's that the state controls uh, the curriculum you're allowed to teach, or the state testing is the reason you're not allowed to teach certain history subjects. While that might be the case, I would encourage you to engage with those state representatives who can make that change. Unfortunately, uh, State Senator David Craig and State Representative Ken Skaronsky are not here tonight. I don't expect them to engage with you on this issue, but I will. I am here. My email address and personal phone number are on that card. They're also on my website, and if you go to March 2nd in your inbox, you can respond to the email I sent you. I would like to engage with you on this policy. If you feel gated by the state of Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin should change for the people in this district. That's what I'm doing and I'm running to represent. I'm here to amplify the voices of students and parents and teachers and administrators alike. So I would encourage you not only to engage with them, but to engage with the state of Wisconsin and don't use state testing, state funding as an excuse to do nothing. And so I'd like to echo that to the folks here tonight and for the record, if you hear an excuse about state funding, know that there could have been a conversation about it and there was not. Thank you. Thank you to those who are engaging and I encourage you to continue to do so. Thank you. Hello, my name is Susan Fernandez. I live at 7712 Briarwood Drive in Franklin. Um, I'm not unfamiliar to some of you. I have been at school board meetings in the past. I was not planning on speaking. In fact, my daughter probably hoped that I wasn't going to speak, um, and I really wasn't. So I promise not to ramble, and I promise um, not to go off on a tangent. But I will, the reason I, that prompted me to get up, um, although he, he was a tough act to follow, um, was because of that lack of engagement and maybe not in necessarily just engagement, but action. Um, the last time, I believe one of the last times um, I was here and spoke was about uh, safety in our schools. Um, and that was two years ago, I believe, probably then at that point, that time um, I had emailed and shared a lot of information three years prior. I'm still a Franklin resident, I have had three, uh, kids, adults, go through this school system, I will say successfully. Um, and 
it was hard for me to listen to Katie, who my kids went to school with from kindergarten. I knew her story, and it wasn't until I was a 40-year-old adult, I'm older than that now, <laughs> that I acknowledged what unconscious bias and white privilege is. And to hear her story told and realize that I, as an adult at that time, with my kids going to school with her, could not assist in any way, shape, or form, was tough. But as an adult who volunteered a ton of time in elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, multiple clubs, multiple programs, nothing happens. I have lost my filter. I don't need the filter that I used to have when you had to play the political games with your kids in school and who's who and all that. I don't have a filter anymore. I honestly don't care. I am embarrassed that I stand up and speak to no avail. There is very little action. I have had phone calls, heated phone calls, that result in nothing. The amount that we sweep under the carpet, whether it's the post-it notes with black or black and white bubblers, whether it's what happens at, at basketball games, it freaking happens. Acknowledge it. Provide the students what they want, what they asked for. I sat in that room in that ECC building where students came before you and asked for programs for AIDS to be a part of the change. We are not doing enough. You, I'm sorry, you are not doing enough. And honestly, people don't come to school board meetings because when you do come to school board meetings to try and engage, nothing happens. If this is not put on the agenda, Shame on you all. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jalen Smith, 7830 South 66th Street. That is my mother back there in the blue. She came up here and spoke earlier. And um, being a young black man in a majority white school is not easy. It's difficult to go to school where for me, it's, it's, it's awkward, I can say. It's awkward to go into school and see a few black people here and there, oh, yo, what's up, man, what's up, man? And I have to, and it's, it's I have to communicate with whites all the time, my teachers, my, my counselors. It's, it's not easy. It's awkward. And then for the racist remarks, people asking me, hey, yo, do I get the N-word pass? I'm trying to shake, like, no. It's, I think light needs to be shined on this. And unfortunately, I didn't come and write anything, but I was motivated from everyone here today to come up here and speak and at least give my heart and my tips. Like things like this to be a black man in the school, I feel like more, more black people should be able to be in this school to come out here and speak, to give their opinions, to share their heart with you and how their school is. Me, I wanna attend the HBCU, but I don't even have knowledge on that from the school. I have to go and Google that. Everything that I want to know about my culture, I have to go to Google. I have to go to my mom or my grandmother. I think more history on each and every culture needs to be shared. Every culture, not just whites, not just blacks. Even without this racism going on, black culture needs to be shared. Every other culture needs to be shared. Everything needs to be shared. Because at the end of the day, we are all humans to do the same thing, survive, repopulate, and just keep going on with life. And for some students in the school to not understand that, that is baffling to me. It's, it's, it's like, I can't even say. How do you not understand and you can just go in your life thinking that you're superior, one race is superior. We are all equal. If I wrote more, I wish I could have more to say, but that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hello, my name is Angeline. I graduated in 2010, and what prompted me to come up today was really all of these young people telling their stories and the fact that this has been a complete failure of doing absolutely nothing since I was in school 10 years ago. Um, 
I was tasked to plan our 10-year reunion and I got like so many comments from people saying they don't want to associate with each other and they don't want to talk to people because everyone, a bunch of people are racist and they're posting things on social media and it just is really sad that this is still going on like after all this time and I read the story about post-it notes over the bubblers in 2018 and it was, it was really just sad that there was no disciplinary action that we were really aware of of what happened to those kids. I feel like it was just swept under the rug and no one really talked about it and it was embarrassing to like be from Franklin knowing that that was still going on. Um, and so I guess I'm just wondering like what actions are taken for when students are racist towards one another? Is it just a simple like slap on the wrist and they go on with their day or I feel like there should be something more severe when people act this way because it's just absolutely unacceptable. It should be expulsion, there should be a zero tolerance for this. I feel like it needs to be taught early on. There's so many things I feel like I want to say, but I, I think the main thing is we need racial education in our schools. We did not learn anything in 2010. We're still not learning anything in 2020. I think now is the time to be on the right side of history and go the direction that we're going, which is we're in a country, a diverse country filled with people of different cultures, and when you go out and explore the rest of the world and see these different cultures and live in them, you start to understand that it's really important. So I hope you guys will do something, and I hope all the stories that you heard today will make change actually happen. So thank you. Thank you. I know I already spoke, but I'm here to share a story from Julia Daines, who is a 2021 graduate of FHS. She wrote, Hi, my name is Julia Daines, and I'm going to be a junior at FHS. Before I went to Franklin Public Schools in fourth grade, I truly didn't believe that racism existed in a place like school, a place where I'm supposed to feel safe. It didn't get too bad until I entered high school. High school is already hard enough, but one thing I don't need is to be judged so blatantly just because of my skin color. It all started in history class. I will never forget that history class. We were working on a group project when one of the boys sitting at a nearby table tried to guess my ethnicity. So, what are you? Are you half black, half white? He asked me. I was shocked, but at first I thought he was just curious. I'm Puerto Rican, I responded proudly. This wasn't the end of him. Later that night, he continuously harassed me in a group chat with my other friends. He called me racial slurs and other hurtful names. I was unsettled that night, and my parents took notice right away. I showed them the text messages and they told me what he was doing was not okay. We addressed it to the school. I thought that they would have made it better. Instead, they made it quite worse. The next day, he was still in that history class. In fact, he seemed to act as if the whole situation was a joke. He threatened me and my brother. This was also brought to the high school's attention. Long story short, I was told he would be punished and he would be moved out of my classes. This didn't make me feel better. I still looked at him and his friends in the hall. I still felt out of place at school. The next year, he was my grade's powder puff coach. I immediately scheduled a meeting with my athletic director. He told me that the boy simply just made a mistake and that he learned his lesson and that I should move on. That year, I wasn't able to do powder puff. He was. They chose the bully over the victim. This has been the story of my life at FHS. I find myself counting down the days until I finally get to leave. I will leave behind a school where I hear the N-word being said in the halls. I will leave behind a school where a teacher referred to me as, quote, the little Mexican girl. I will leave behind a school where I never felt safe. These are Julia's words, and this story happened this past school year. And I know a year ago, I stood before you um, pleading you to reinstate the Empowered Women Club. And while that was swept under the rug due to policy provisions or whatever, Mr. Volo said about that, we should have a group like that. That is a place where people can talk about these types of issues outside of class. Those types of forums are important for students. And I got the basic argument, oh, that was ended, there was an empowered men club that wanted to begin, boys will be boys. And maybe some of you are thinking, oh, these are just some rotten apples saying bad things, kids will be kids. But no, kids need to be held accountable. This district needs to be held accountable. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Is there any other community comment? Any other comment? Hearing none, 
Um, I'll close the community comment, and um, I would like to allow Dr. Miller to um, respond on behalf of the district. Uh, we did receive um, the um, call to action on Monday, and that gave an opportunity for a response. So, Dr. Miller? Okay, hopefully you can hear me okay. Thank you. <clears throat> So I want to thank you sincerely for your feedback today. I heard every single word you said, and you did a very, very good job of conveying your thoughts and feelings and requests. So thank you for that. And thank you for sharing your passion for improving our schools. And more importantly, thank you for sharing your passion for improving the human condition. I'm proud to have been a part of this district for the last 30 years. And during that time, I've witnessed Franklin become a community rich in diversity, racially, ethnically, by ability, by sexuality, across gender, religion, class, and their intersections. In our schools, we currently have students who speak over 40 different languages. As a school district, we're privileged to be able to provide learning experiences in an environment that's greatly enhanced by this diversity. I'm also proud to share that Franklin Public Schools has five core values that support the work we do on behalf of students. These core values are equity, personal growth, innovation, stewardship, and well-being. The five values were developed in 2018 by a representative group of 44 stakeholders, including the Board of Education, staff, students, and community members, who focused on three key questions. Who are we? Where are we? And where are we going? And there's some individuals in this room today who were part of that group. Each value is tied to a definition that supports our district coherence plan. We believe that these core values must ground the edu educational experience of students in order for them to achieve their highest levels of personal excellence. During the first seven months of this past school year, we have focused our attention on our core value of equity. Equity goes across all other core values, it's ongoing, never ending, and at the core of who we are as a district. We define equity as ensuring access to opportunities and resources for all individuals. More specifically, it means everyone is included, all means all. Everyone's treated respectfully, Students and staff have access to what they need to succeed. We meet students and staff where they are at, and achievement gaps are not acceptable. This work is so important to us that we have partnered with Integrated Comprehensive Systems for Equity, or ICS, to develop a multi-year plan. ICS is a framework and process to assist school districts from moving from one that understands equality to one that works to create equity through dismantling centuries of inequitable practices. We have learned that the system needs to change to ensure that no one student or family feels marginalized. Whether that individual or family feels or is marginalized by race, ethnicity, gender, language, sexuality, socioeconomic status, or ability. There are four cornerstones of this work, which include focusing on equity, aligning staff and students, transforming teaching and learning, and leveraging funding and policy. If you'd like more information about the four cornerstones of our equity work, just Google icsequity.org. We set out to do this very important work by first ensuring that the adults in our system understand the difference 
between expecting equality and working to dismantle educational inequities. Throughout the 2019 and 20 school year, every employee of Franklin Public Schools, including food service, bus drivers, custodians, office personnel, support staff, administrators, and teachers, and this Board of Education participated in ongoing professional development to learn about the history of marginalization, shifting our thinking from deficit-based to asset-based, and identity development. Our work was cut short due to COVID-19, but when we return in fall, all employees will pick up where we left off, learning about the research related to equity and seeing the results of our own equity audit. We will also be establishing our equity non-negotiables for Franklin Public Schools next fall. These equity non-negotiables will be used to set policy and operationalize equity in our classrooms and schools. They will drive how the curriculum is written and how we approach meeting the needs of each and every student. We know that institutions that dismantle inequities across identities increase the success of all students academically, emotionally, and behaviorally. All of this is just the beginning. Our multi-year plan to focus on our core value of equity includes deepening our learning and making changes to the system in order to ensure a culture, culture of respect that allows us to give every student what they need. We know that doing this re work requires that we all have a better understanding of our own beliefs and the beliefs of others. As the superintendent, I was able to meet with the students from the high school and the multicultural club on two occasions this past school year to learn more about the student perspective. During those two meetings, I learned that our students want to talk about inequities. They don't want our teachers to avoid this topic. I sincerely respect that feedback and believe that our equity professional development is what will help our staff feel confident in their ability to have these conversations with students. I had a third meeting scheduled for the LGBT in March, but unfortunately that didn't happen due to the pandemic. I personally look forward to continuing to meet with students to learn more about how we can improve our equity work together. In closing, I believe we are all called to action to ensure that equity exists in our schools, but we must choose to act in a way that will have a lasting impact it will never work to tell another person to feel differently. What matters is how the system operates to ensure that in our schools, all means all. Thank you again for making your voice heard and advocating for all students. I look forward to hearing more and continuing to lead for equity. Thank you again for coming. Thank you, Dr. Miller. And uh, thank you all for your testimonies and your comment. Um, we all listened, our administrators listened, um, and we'll go from here. Thank you. Our next agenda item is consent agenda. Um, would any board member like to remove an item from the consent agenda? Hearing none, I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Mr. Gamble, is there a second? Second by Mr. Sprague. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, school board announcements. Does any board member have a board announcement? I just wanna let the board know that um, I don't know if anyone is busy tomorrow at one o'clock, but there's a, 
the, the National School Board Association has announced that there's a free webinar available for school board members on um, questions school board members might want to ask about returning to school. Topics include financial considerations, summer needs, and addressing the digital divide. And this is a national perspective on it. Um, if you're interested, um, I'll just send out an email tonight so that you can register tonight. But it's free and it's a national perspective, so it's an hour long in case you're interested. Um, school board calendar, item seven. We have a regular Board of Education meeting Wednesday, July 8, 2020 uh, at the Education and Community Center at 6 o'clock p.m. Regular Board of Education meeting August 19, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. at the Education and Community Center, followed by our annual meeting of the electors August 19, 2020 at the Education and Community Center at 6 o'clock p.m. Um, Dr. Miller, are we planning on possibly moving the annual meeting here, or do you think our meetings might still be in the ECC? Um, or yeah. We're still considering that. Yeah, we're still going to consider. consider it. Okay, thank you. And then um, item eight, our district administrator update. Dr. Miller. Okay, hopefully it's not buzzing too much. <laughs> So just a few things I was going to share tonight with everyone. Um, summer school started. Isn't that exciting? Today was the first day of summer school for our high school students. Um, we, of course, are doing virtual summer school. Um, we have uh, 86 students registered uh, for math, English, biology, and or chemistry. So um, that was the latest number that I received from Dr. Reuter. Um, we will begin the elementary virtual summer school on July 6th. All the summer school ends July 24th. After the elementary, we have 249 students signed up and 179 middle school stu students signed up. Uh, we're offering uh, 27 different enrichment classes, uh, courses K-8. Oh, let's just turn that off. get the microphone, it didn't work, hopefully. All right, so where I left off, we had 27 enrichment courses, K-8, um, multiple uh, sections of math and reading, um, and exploratory classes like about things about the ocean and the world and the country. So um, just summer school's on its way. Um, the other major thing that's underway, do you have a question? Yes. yes. What is, what is, you said 80 something, 249 and 179 were the numbers. What is the normal, is that normal or is that less or more compared to previous years? Good question. Um, I think if we, ref we think back to um, credit recovery, that's what the high school is. Um, we're standing kind of close to where we've been in the past. Um, we had students, it's optional um, to sign up for. We highly recommend our counselors and high school administration worked with um, students this second semester as well as from first semester who were credit deficient um, to sign up. But given that it's in a virtual environment, there was some mixed review on signing up. But our numbers are higher than we expected, which is a good sign that students are engaging, so they want to be on track for graduation. The um, two, what did I say, 249 elementary is quite a bit lower yeah. than what we would have if we had uh, in-person summer school with kids. Same way with middle school? Yes. Uh, yeah. we, we usually cap out at the elementary at over 500 because of space confinements. Um, we, had, we had a good response rate of over 1,000 parents responding to our summer school survey. And based on that, we ran um, the sections we did and we got what we got from the sample. We're still very proud that that many of families and students want to engage in a virtual environment, which is something unique for summer school as well as school this past spring. Um, the other thing we're spending a lot of time doing, of course, is talking about um, how to return to school in fall. It is our intent to bring the children back unless 
for some reason we'd be prohibited from doing that because of uh, a large spread of COVID. But right now we are, we are planning on um, returning to school in fall. Um, and that was communicated with families and staff last week. Um, next Wednesday, we intend to uh, send a survey to our families to gather some information about their experience uh, in the virtual environment and to ask some questions about um, how they feel about the social distancing um, possibilities that we're thinking about, um, getting some feedback from them around that and their level of comfort with uh, that. Um, I just found out uh, that the DPI has issued to all the schools in the state of Wisconsin enough masks for every child in the state to wear a mask to school. And um, they've also issued uh, thermometers, certainly not enough thermometers that we would have one for every teacher to be taking every child's temperature. But um, there were, I believe, 19 thermometers that were, were allocated for our school district for our use, I would presume, in their health rooms. Is so that infrared thermometer? You know, I didn't. I, I said thermal, so Probably. yeah. So um, that was new news. Um, and then on Monday, we'll hear from um, the Department of Public Instruction regarding their guidelines for returning to school. I'm hearing it's about an 80-page document. Uh, has a large checklist. They're using the word guidelines, but really they're more um, like considerations for school districts. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing those on Monday and um, pairing those with um, what we have in our mind in terms of our plan, and then also working with um, our nurses and Courtney Dave over at the Franklin Health Department on our plan. So a lot of work going going on about with, with the back to school planning. And then just finally, um, tonight um, you'll hear and see uh, the first draft of our 2020-21 budget. Um, as a result of the impact of the virus on our economy, uh, the budget is based on a zero increase per student um, uh, in the state uh, revenue limit. So um, you will see that shortly. And because we have responsibly um, have balanced our budget over time, you're going to hear that we're planning to continue to provide all of our quality educational programs for our students next year. So Mr. Milzer will convey in his overview this evening how this budget will allow us to do that. So there's just a few highlights for me this evening. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Dr. Miller. Okay, uh, we'll move on to uh, item nine reports, presentations, and other school board business. 9A, the CISA 1 contract for 2020 21. Dr. Miller. The contract that we engage with CISA in annually, um, the, the larger costs you'll see are related to our seats in alternative. Uh, in the alternative setting for some of our students as well as uh, personnel needs. So without getting into the specifics of that, um, this contract's pretty similar to previous contracts. If Ms. Cody has anything to add, um, she would uh, be able to answer any questions you might have about what we are contracting with CISA for. Is this on? Oh, it's on, yes. <laughs> I was the one to have to say, is this on? Um, I really don't know. I have to look back at our previous years. Do you know, Jen? I can look. I, can look. I don't have that out on, at my fingertips. If you look, however, at the items, um, there aren't really any new items in there that we haven't been contracting no. for before. So, correct. If, if it and the the seats at the alternative schools have not increased. Those contracts, those agreements, have continued to be consistent as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking for a motion to approve the CISA one contract for 2020-21. Do I hear that motion? Motion by Mrs. Larson. Is there a second? Second. 
Second by Mr. Gamble, any discussion? I, it's not hard to look that last year's up just by Googling, even right now if you wanted to meetings, if, if one of the administrators wanted to. Uh, yeah, oh, it went down 5,000. Okay, so that depends on what services we're taking this year compared to last year, because I know CISA 1 did raise fees um, by a small percentage on some of the items. Um, but like project success and turning point, which are our main costs there, um, th those are for dis students with disabilities, correct? From what I, um, some of them are. Project success alternative program for students with disabilities in 9 through 12 and turning point elementary program for students with emotional and behavioral related disabilities, grades K through 8. Um, and where are those programs located? I'm sorry, Linda, I didn't hear you. Where are the programs located? Projects of success and turning point? Um, we've, they're at, we have a couple of different Who's the culprit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> um, so we do have a consortium with. Um, we're working with South Milwaukee and Oak Creek, and so one is South Milwaukee. One is um, there's another site out in Pewaukee. Um, again, as part of our CISA, the CISA network. I'm trying to see what else is on here that may. Um, those are really the only off-site pieces listed here. So we've been a part of this organization for some time now and really have become far more active actually as members and um, this is an organization of board members and superintendents who work to um, advocate for education through influencing legislation. So um, I'm currently serving on the executive board for um, SWSA and I believe we benefit from our membership. I'm looking for a motion to approve the SWSA agreement for 2020-21. We hear that motion. So moved. Motion by Mr. Kwiatkowski. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Sprague. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Item 9C is the approval of the 2020-21 Board of Education meeting date. Um, you'll find a list of the meeting dates in your packet. Um, just to let you know, the, in January, the uh, WASD convention is scheduled for January 20, 21, and 22. If it's held, I think that it will be held. Um, no, I think that the dates pair pretty well with the dates that we've had this year for meetings. Okay, I'll look for a motion then to include the 2020-2021 Board of Education meeting date. Do I hear that motion? So moved. Motion by Mr. Lewis. 
I'm okay with the way it is. I think we'll have we'll have the information we have at that point, and we'll be able to present the first draft of the budget. Okay. We could always add a date. Right. We could add a date, yes, but um, we're getting, and I understand the work that needs to go into the budget, we need to even get it to work like we did today, the day of the meeting, that if there are any problems, Well, we would know that prior to June, so we could, I mean, we may know that in May or whatever, and then add a date in June if Jim thinks we need it. You might get the gist of that, so that you could suggest that in June? Right. I think we can see how things are going at the time. There may be information, there may not be information, and then we'll go on the best that we can do at that point, and then maybe it's later in the year that we need to look at it more closely. you already got some background in terms of the why and us having this additional request is from a student uh, who exceeded our math curriculum last year. And I don't really have anyone else to say. I think any questions that you'd like to have in terms of the degrees for this request. But that's why there's different institutions. This is you can get all that very calculus at a school because they have to find this respect. And all these institutions are flexible and it's working together. So the, the only state statute is the application deadline of March 1st. The institutions that are listed there, we've been in contact with all of their early college credit program or start college now program offices and had that contact with them saying yes, we can make this work. And is one student? No, we have three. Yes. Typically you have, you have one, two, three applications. You have one student. The uh, budget document is um, in board docs for you. Um, tonight, I'll go over um, the highlights and introduce the budget. It's the first draft of the budget. We'll have the second draft in August at the annual meeting. And then the final draft is in October uh, for the state lets us know uh, what we have for aid. 
when we know our student count. Uh, you'll have three weeks to read through the budget and send any questions you have. And really, we look at this as the culmination of everything you've, you've heard at the board meetings about the programs we're going to offer and the staffing report. Uh, all of that is contained in the budget. A um, couple of things. Uh, enrollment is important because it's part of the revenue minute. Estimated that we would go up 10 students this year. Uh, another change is the change in benefits, where we bid out our health, dental, and vision insurance, and uh, we had a decline of 5.6% in the health and dental, and 5.9% uh, in the vision insurance. So uh, saving some money there. On page seven. We have a new section, never thought of putting in a section on COVID-19 related budget information before, uh, but it seemed appropriate this year. Uh, I kind of go over the effects of the pandemic both on 2019-20 and 2021. Uh, so in 1920, uh, uh, we had lost revenue of about $40,000, uh, mainly in parking fees and athletics and uh, field trips. We also learned that School fee software is made to take these, it's not made to give these back. So it's, it's a very difficult process to go through, but we have to go through it because people didn't get what they paid for and we needed to refund those. So it's been, it's been a challenge, and I'm hoping they do some work on their software uh, in case we run into this again. Uh, under school finance and state aid, uh, we're in the second year or starting the second year of the, the biennium for the state and the state had uh, put in there that we would get $179 more per student in the revenue limit, as well as an increase in special education funding from 26 to 30 uh, percent. And at this point, the, the state has had some dramatic losses of revenue, at least to this point. Uh, if the economy turns around and things get working again, uh, some of that could be mitigated. Uh, but they have lost uh, quite a bit of revenue and they guaranteed that we would get all of our money for 2020, uh, not necessarily so for 2021. Um, so there really isn't any information on whether they would possibly make an adjustment in 2021 or whether they would make an adjustment in the next biennium when we really have to redo the entire budget anyway. Uh, so we looked at three scenarios for the budget, uh, the existing scenario of the law of $179 increase, a uh, zero increase, and a $50 per student loss in the revenue limit. And the budget is built on the zero increase, uh, although there's numbers in there for what it would be if we lost 50 or if we got the 179, which I think is extremely unlikely. Uh, another thing is additional revenue from the federal government and the CARES Act. We're estimated to receive about $282,000. Uh, the process they use goes through Title I, although the funds are not Title I funds and can be used more broadly than that. So we're working on that process now to find out how, how that will work exactly. Uh, additional expenses included in the budget, we have about $300,000 worth of additional expenses uh, due to COVID-19 for next year but we aren't done with our planning yet for bringing students back to school. And uh, I'm positive there will be additional costs uh, in staffing and materials to do that. Uh, we just don't have exact plans yet. Once we do, uh, we'll revise the budget to reflect that. And that will be in the October version uh, of the budget. Uh, I have fund balance listed. Um, because we worked hard over a long period of time to build that. And one of the points in our fund balance policy is that uh, it's made for unanticipated expenditures and unrealized revenues. And it seems like COVID-19 is the biggest not getting the revenue and it's costing us a lot of money situation that we face. So, um, we would, we would be able to use fund balance or lean on that uh, for a year or so uh, and so that we can keep going and keep giving the students the education that we know that they need. Uh, 
while kind of riding it out until we get to the other side of this. Jim, yeah. you mentioned it, you're saying the expense savings back on page seven of 478,000 Plus, you're saying there's 282,000 we'll be getting from the federal government. Well, that's 750,000 um, dollars. Even if we lose the, you know, the worst case scenario minus 50 dollars per cent, 216,000, we're still doing okay then. Is what you're right. saying. Even if we have an additional 300,000 dollars in expenses, we're still okay. That's 500,000 dollars, so we're still plus 250. We're we're still okay. Yeah. The, the I mean, the 300 could, could turn into 600 by the time we're done, yep. and we don't know how much the state will take away from us because we're uh, they spend most of their extra money on, on the schools. But we're preparing for what we think might happen, um, and if, if it didn't work out, we could lean on our fund balance. But you're right; we're in an excellent position to take care of it without. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a quick right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, on page nine, we have uh, an expense graph that shows, uh, oddly enough, that we spend most of our money on staff uh, for education. Not surprising to anyone, 75.3% and 18% on purchase services, uh, other supplies and so forth is 6.7%. On the revenue side, uh, there's a graph, the, uh, the green color is the local tax revenue, Blue is state and federal aid, and the red is the local non-tax revenue. Uh, the green and the blue uh, pretty much entirely make up the revenue limit, and it's dictated by the size of that blue part of the graph. If that gets larger, the tax levy goes down. If it gets smaller, the tax levy gets larger to make up for the difference. Uh, now looking at tax implications, uh, we're looking at a 1% increase in the tax levy for next year. And that would include fully funding uh, our education for children. Uh, it would include funds to defease uh, about $1 million in long-term debt. And we're also looking at refinancing. Uh, we have an opportunity coming up in November, and we're hoping that rates are still favorable, uh, where we could save um, probably over $500,000 in interest over the life of some of these So we're looking at doing that as well. What's the, uh, what's the projected interest rate differential in the uh, refinancing? Oh, I don't have to call it the top of my head, but I can get that for you. Uh, it's going, it isn't going down as much as you would think, um, but uh, it will only take, uh, I think, a point four differential uh, to make it work for us, at least at that level. I mean, we could save some money with less than that. So the uh, estimated property tax implication for every hundred thousand dollars of assessed value uh, would go up to ten dollars and fifty-seven cents is what we're estimating at this point. And of course, these are estimates. Um, nothing's been determined from the state. We don't know the number of students. And of course, the uh, revenue loss during the pandemic. So that makes it even more uh, iffy. On the next page, we've got a uh, tax rate graph that shows uh, over the last five years, we've averaged a uh, 1.2% increase in, uh, in the taxes. And then we have the budget adoption document, and this is the one that the board uh, votes on and adopts. That would be in July. Uh, you'll notice that funds 60 and 72 have been removed. Um, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board issued statement 84. It's indicated that if uh, the administration had um, kind of a hand in working with student activities uh, and scholarships, they, they couldn't be in those funds and they wanted to move. Uh, so we've moved them to Fund 21, our special revenue fund for donations. Um, which uh, the biggest change there is that all of the uh, checks and paperwork will have to be handled by the business services department rather than being issued by the schools. So it's a change in operation and more work for the business department, but uh, we have to comply with this. 
and this was really the way to do it. Uh, we were given a year's grace period uh, to extend the next year because of the pandemic, but we are implementing it at the end of this year, so we'll have that completely done. Uh, so I will, uh, I will let you peruse this over the next few weeks and uh, send me your questions, and I'll uh, get the answers out to everyone. We would find out very soon if they were following the open enrollment regular process, but they have the opportunity based on what their reason is to leave any time during the summer. So uh, we would we might not know until school starts. Uh, but really with, with everything that's going on and the ability uh, that we're building in to go virtual or be here, I was hoping that there isn't a lot of that that goes on. What would the scenario be if there was no tax increase? How would that affect it? If there was no tax increase, yes. Um, we, would, uh, we would have less defeasance. Part of, part of the tax levy is paying off some of our long-term debt early okay. and getting rid of it. So any of the interest associated with that over the next 20 years that we're going to pay it off, we continue to pay it off. So that the saving, we might get the saving. off of our public network. I don't know if we're going to pay the bill or whatever. Uh, uh, again, this year, since Fund 46 is, is now operating, we're able to do projects out of it. We have scheduled the project at Pleasant View to uh, make the office more secure and have all visitors go through the office and move it to the front of the building. Uh, we were going to make another deposit from Fund 10 into Fund 46 that would cover that as well as to provide some uh, extra money for projects for the future. Uh, so we're looking to move $2 million from Fund 10 to Fund 46 uh, for that purpose, and we would make that uh, expenditure, we need to make it by the end of July uh, in order for it to qualify as much as the total of July. Uh, so we probably do it in June, uh, and then we would be set up for that. Jim, is that primarily the results of the current fiscal year, two million dollars? Uh, well, we're taking it out of fund balance essentially to do that. But if, if we have more than that left at the beginning, by uh, the end of this year, then it would be out of fund balance. So, is that reflected in the budget you just presented to us? I didn't hear that. Is that um, part of the budget you just presented to us? I do have the two million reflected as going to fund 46. That's already it's, in that it's, not, it's not part of the expenses of the budget because it's, it's, a, it's a 2019 20 expense. Oh, it's this year. Okay. Mm -hmm.
have to do it this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're spending the money next year. So working alongside um, teaching and learning, um, our student services staff had quite a, quite a big job um, to meet the academic needs of students, but then also to continue um, to provide services in all of those additional areas like social emotional learning um, and different therapies and things like that. So when you, first of all, um, when it came to student services provided through IEPs, we did continue to um, provide those services to the fullest extent possible within that virtual environment. So again, as Dr. Reuter mentioned, we really had to focus on what was essential 
for our students when it came to the day-to-day -day learning as well as um, helping them continue to work towards their IEP goals. Um, so we um, came together and really took a look at that. Um, we met quite often and really from, from the get-go, um, teachers made every effort they could to um, continue to meet with students on a regular basis. Another piece that was really critical to this was um, the communication and collaboration with families. So uh, we talked a lot about um, looking at the goals and looking at what students needed and then communicating that up front with families and then making sure that they were on board and they were clear with how we were going to be providing those services because it, it does look different um, in a virtual setting. Um, and then that ongoing communication throughout and then really um, thinking about what would be next steps for students, you know, planning forward. So um, we were, I think, pretty successful. I was really proud of the work that student services um, cross-categorical teachers did as well as our therapists. Um, so we had the learning side and then also a big piece of special ed is compliance. So um, again, we worked regularly with the um, building level staff as well as district just to make sure that people were very clear on um, what those next steps were when it came to um, continuing with um, services, with conducting meetings, um, IEP meetings continuing with evaluations, so there were a lot of pieces that we had to work through locally as, as additional guidance came from the state level as well as um, the federal level. Um, so that was uh, special ed, and again, we were looking at working with families at early childhood all the way up through, you know, 21. Um, so it was interesting to talk with teachers because they were very excited about the partnerships that they um, developed with families because just like Dr. Reuter was talking about 4K. You know, we, we have children, again, who are in receiving services in early childhood, and so it was really a matter of working with the families to help them um, work with their own children and what to look for. And um, so there were, um, again, th those relationships are really critical um, in helping parents work with their children. Also, when it came to providing services for our students identified, um, as English language learners. Again, um, those teachers continue to work collaboratively with classroom teachers. Um, we worked hard to connect with families, provide additional interpreters as needed, um, and just to, again, continue with the language development and then support them with their academics. And finally, when it came to students who were receiving interventions in academic areas, Students who were receiving the, the um, tier three interventions, which would be the highest level, um, those students did continue to receive daily um, intervention with the interventionists. And again, those interventionists worked alongside um, the teaching and learning, um, the math and literacy specialists as well to identify effective ways to deliver those. And then we also had students who do receive social emotional support um, and interventions, so those did continue as well with our school psychologists um, and counselors. Um, so we really learned a lot and clarified what was really important and what was effective as we were delivering all of these um, supports for students. Yeah, I think as you, what we, we learned from a support standpoint, we were just told totally this multiple times when uh, we spoke to this previous at board meetings during um, the pandemic. We really identified we a lot of stuff in education High school level department leaders, once we knew the school was not going to be doing face to face, department leaders were able to look at the scope of the curriculum for the remainder of the year leading into that finals week and really identify okay, what, we, what can we do and how is this going to make sure that we give the best possible learning opportunity? 
across um, discipline work as well as universal instruction and the special instruction um, came together that we want to replicate once we get back to the mm -hmm. um, So one of the areas that was interesting was the encore areas. Um, how do you do physical education and music? <laughs> um, so we, we made the decision early on at the elementary level um, based on capacity and the new role that parents were doing with at home to um, pause or um, suspend social studies and science curriculum and focus on the essentials of reading, writing, and math. And then at the encore areas, um, we, we still pushed up content, but we did not create the writing feedback around that. And so we know that when, as we progress now back face to face in the fall, we really have to look at where did we move off and where might those gaps be and how are we going to adjust our curriculum and under other guidelines and restrictions that will have to be physical benefits, but knowing that we want to ensure those essential outcomes for the community. Do you want to speak to the support staff and the roles and how their, their roles will look a little different during this program? Sure. Um, so we, um, we, we deployed our support staff um, just really based on student need. So we worked with, um, again, at the building level, checked in with the, all of the principals who worked with their teachers, um, and they looked back at some of the, the information that they had on students and um, developed a bit of uh, a system to gather input from teachers on how students were progressing. And then based on that input, um, we really developed a, a, a um, schedule for our support staff then to be able to connect um, with students who needed that extra support. So. Um, we um, set them up with the technology, gave them a bit of training. Um, we had some of our teachers model some um, specific strategies that were necessary to support students effectively through the virtual environment. So um, they, again, were really an important part of helping our students move forward. So. We, we know that.
pursuing and understand how we can do this and how we can uh, maybe pull kids together virtually over the summer, student groups. We know we have many clubs and activities at high school groups of kids that we can run into focus groups and like what the student experience is like to their eyes, as well as middle school kids and then elementary kids. Um, and run focus groups similar to the youth that we do in curriculum review process as well as um, student engagement um, for uh, school improvement plan. And then we are analyzing the learned a lot. Um, mm -hmm. It can be always better and we're seeking feedback from the key stakeholders so that we can do um, if this were to ever happen again. With that, Ms. Cody and I have you know, any questions you have about you know, the last 51 days. What happened with the uh, in-school clinics? Did they still so the counseling clinics? Do they still happen? Or what I, oh, I'm sorry. I'm having such a difficult time hearing you here. I apologize. Are you, you were asking about the clinic, is that correct? Yes. Um, they did continue to provide services for families um, throughout. They just, um, they offered, they did offer some virtual sessions as well as meetings, you know, in their local office if they could. I'm also curious about what the high school day looked like because um, could students sign at any time or did they have to show up at a class, you know, like at Ella Grove this period and had to be online at that time? How did the high school day look like? I'm really curious about, you know, we always hear about high school starts way too early in the morning. Yeah. Did they have an impact? Did kids you know, suddenly could do it whenever they wanted to? Did they do better? What happened with that? Yeah, I, I think it's hard to gauge if kids did better because the variables of starting high school at 9 o'clock face to face versus starting virtually, yeah. I mean, that it's different in comparison. Um, and Mr. Bowles, who joined in it. That uh, teachers have office hours at the high school level, so the day didn't look like a 7 15 or 2 34 or whatever the, the end date of our, our high school day, just like it didn't look the exact same like that at the middle or elementary level. Um, there was probably upwards, um, from, from our understanding, middle and high school kids had a longer day from the standpoint of their completion and engagement. They had more classes to be ran full on four courses in all classes at the middle and high level. Um, so it wasn't maybe like I have to be on at 7.25 for my first 1A block class. There was pushed out content, and then there were office hours for, for kids to connect with teachers. Um, the feedback, we, we didn't have a consistent platform at the high school. Teachers worked from the platforms that they were accustomed to. And so there's a lot of email exchange, and those are some of the things that we rectify in the future if we um, for virtual learning. So the day didn't look like I'm sitting at my computer and oh, the bell rang in my head and now I go to the next class. It was, here's my work for the day in totality and the independence level of the student with emphasis from their teacher was, okay, this is, you have to navigate how you work this. And it, it, similarly, at the elementary level, we had feedback from some parents who said, I know that the learning is updated at eight o'clock in the morning, but I'm on conference calls, my wife is on conference calls, we're not gonna get to it until the afternoon of their time. Okay, we had to manage that as, they, as families were trying to manage the new normal. Um, and, but then those, those fence posts of teachers setting up time to meet with kids via Google Meet, that was a consistent piece that they worked with families through um, Google Calendar or Simon G. So all the teaching was recorded, essentially? Yes. For, for the, the majority of teaching was recorded via um, videos. And then there were pieces of one-on-one -on -one or small group for teachers to remediate or reteach. Um, what started to transpire across the system um, in various pockets at the middle school and predominantly at the elementary was there were morning meetings or there was a class meeting, like you should check in and, hey, let's look into everyone's life. What's going on? And, you know, just the things we, we take for granted in school, the conversation pieces that help engage kids that have to Same thing happened in office. You're used to being in office, saying hello to everybody. All of a sudden, coffee. you were <laughs> in yeah. your house and never seeing anybody <laughs> for months.
still at work, and she had younger siblings, the student, and we was taking care of them as their teacher. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's a testament to our teaching staff of being flexible beyond the you know eight to four or seven to three o'clock school day of okay, in order to engage with the student, help them progress in being credit in an English credit in the course, I'm gonna meet with them in the evening because they're doing a job to help their siblings who were in the elementary system. So that, that's just one story, but we think about the impact it was on all of us in our environment with families at home and what it might be, but then you think about kids became parents in certain situations and teachers while still trying to go to school. I guess I would hope that just one thing we learned is that flexibility is valuable. When you talk about IEPs, you know, always having a parent have to show up at school between seven and three to meet for an IEP. They have jobs; they mm -hmm. have to get there. Yeah, and that kind of flexibility, mm -hmm. I think, is mm -hmm. we should take that with us. Yeah, yeah, we talked about that too. That very thing, um, how we will schedule our IEPs in a different way now, given the virtual mm -hmm. options. It, we hope it will be um, more accommodating for families. see everybody again in person. Uh, I think I'm going to start with the mic and give some feedback. I'll turn it off. And do that. Uh, the full report is in uh, Word Docs. Uh, and Dr. Lawyer and Ms. Cody really did a nice job of kind of segueing to this report. Right? Back in the fall, uh, I had the opportunity to come to the board and kind of talk through uh, our goals for the year and where we were going, right, in terms of our school improvement. Right, every year we produce an annual scorecard uh, related to our plan and it helps focus our work for the year. Uh, and at that time, I had the opportunity to share with you our strategies for the year where we were going. Uh, since then, we had an opportunity to hear from our principals a couple of times in the fall and then again in January uh, as they shared their building specific plans and talked about how they were you know, taking all of those, those district level strategies and, and making them work in their way, right, based on their and circumstances the area that they had to work in. Um, and so this report uh, really serves to give you an update from the end of January when we last heard
Additionally, as we kind of move through the report, uh, it's going to talk a little bit about our operations staff. Certainly, I, I referenced we continue our work around equity. Um, but beyond that, our operations teams, our departmental leaders, uh, continue to focus on ways that we can collect better information about our impact and understanding how we can focus on particular areas for improvement. And so in the report, we're going to see a list of surveys that were developed over the course of this year and deployed uh, in various departmental areas to gather some information about the impact of our work from an operations Qualtrics, the system we're using for deploying the surveys, really has transformed the way in which we collect data, uh, both in terms of quality and in terms of frequency and volume. And that's really going to continue to serve us from a, a development standpoint, from a uh, the standpoint of improvement. Uh, I'll just give an example. Annually, we provide a transportation survey uh, where we gather feedback from families that are going to be driving buses to extend to kids, some of those pieces. And we've done that via Google Forms in the past and some other venues. Uh, and here, we transitioned that into Qualtrics. Uh, and within the first 48 hours, we exceeded any previous amount of survey data we had ever collected from families around that. By the end of the first week, we had over 3,400 responses from parents. So the, the response rates to our surveys, both internally and externally through that system, uh, have been really good and something that we can do in the survey. Uh, the information that we got from those surveys is kind of important to balance it, right? Um, short term, we can act on some of that depth, right? It gives us kind of instant feedback about our impact and everything from food service programming to athletics and activities. But we do need some more time to really understand the baseline of that information. We have to administer those surveys a few times to get a sense of what a solid baseline is and then use that for longer term planning. So in the short term, it gives us some quick feedback that we can use for improvement. Longer term, we'll build that into our improvement process and it will likely become parts of annual reports that you're getting from these departments uh, here at the board level as we're working that into our improvement process as we focus on As you move to pages seven and eight, and this is the, the, the part that changed me a little bit, I love to come to you at this time of year, at the end of December, with an annual assessment report to share our progress, right? And give you some concrete results around the work, right? Here are the goals we set, here's all the things we did learn about, and look, it paid off for us, right? Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the, the pandemic has put some kinks in that plan for us, right? Uh, if you take a look at our, our main goals for the year, many of them are going to say in progress, right? And the reason for that is we just simply don't have the data we need or we had to establish a new baseline this year and we won't have another administration of the survey until fall, right? Uh, from, a, from a student learning standpoint, you heard Dr. Reuter reference 90% engagement. Uh, you heard Dr. Reuter talk about you know, kind of our robust assessment. 
assessment process, right? We have information on student learning. Internal to the work that we're doing. Our teaching staff has information on student learning. We just don't have it from a standardized perspective. And, and that's something we're going to look to kind of bounce back with in the fall. Um, we were able to administer the ACT prior to the shutdown, and so uh, those results came back. Uh, and while I certainly can't broadly share, I can tell you that they were promising in terms of what we saw there in terms of our growth, and I'm excited to share them with you uh, as we move to the fall and we've got this embargo around that, that information and that data. Um, we'll have AP data back this summer. Obviously, all our AP exams happen virtually uh, from home as the College Board works to accommodate our students uh, who are not in school, and so we'll have that information for you as well. Uh, the Ford exam, uh, the ACT Aspire Summit exam, those are all, all eliminated, postponed by the state. Right? Uh, and so uh, the federal government and the state government lifted those requirements uh, in terms of the statutes, uh, and so those, those assessments were not administered. Uh, additionally, we made the internal decision not to administer the math assessment for the ACT Aspire interim assessment uh, because we wanted our teaching staff and our students really focused on the transition to the virtual environment. And additionally, it's really hard to have a secure standardized exam when a student College Board was able to do it with AP because they switched to a more performance-based exam and away from multiple choice. But the, the types of assessment that the math that needs to be as part of interim are, it's not conducive to that. And so uh, it was difficult for us to, to kind of move in that direction. Um, so the, the you know, repercussion of that is, additionally, there won't be any state report card issued in the fall for the student. So we won't have an annual state report card when we publish to our community or we last year. Now, the, the unintended consequence of that is it helps our legislative efforts around the removal or mitigation of the HOC data from the state report card because we have a whole other year before that might impact us again. So it gives us some time and opportunity to do that legislative process and to uh, the winter and the, uh, next year, uh, but we won't have a state report card. Uh, the last thing I would share is kind of the end of the report and the document in terms of where we're going next. Um, we are entering year three of a three-year coherence plan. And so as we build our annual scorecard for next year, we expect it to look fairly similar to how it has been, right? We're going to continue to focus on equity, high level of instruction, engagement, student engagement. Uh, but at the end of the day, we need to be looking at the future and a refresh of that coherence plan. Uh, that'll actually start in the fall with a refresh of the education for employment plan. Uh, those of you that have served on that team in the past, right, we built an initial three-year plan around education for employment. And then when that three years ran out, we would be up in that plan on an annual basis. This fall, we're going to reconvene the team, uh, from Mr. Bolo's leadership, Ms. Frederick's, uh, and we're going to look to uh, where we're going next. What's the next three years of our community engagement around education for employment look like? And so we're going to rebuild that plan. And then that plan, alongside our equity plan, our communications plan, our safety plan, right, will all feed into a refresh of the coherence plan that's likely to start early winter, right around the uh, and then we'll work towards the spring, through the spring to refresh the coherence plan for the next few years. We, we're not starting from scratch by any means, right? We have our core values, we have a vision, we have our priority areas, and we have a lot of good work started around uh, these areas like equity. We're going to continue that. We anticipate much of the plan to look similar to what it does now, uh, but we have an opportunity to think differently about some of that. So it like, gives a chance to like, look at that and think about it. Um, the last thing I would share related to that is one of the areas that we're starting to look at is the way the plan is built now, our goals are very specific, right? To the point where we're looking at a specific point in time data point as the sole measure of whether or not we're making progress. And one of the things we've talked about is moving to a dashboard or array of metrics within our three priority areas that will help us keep better track of the overall health of the organization. So from a student learning perspective, we might be looking at a couple of areas where we're looking to close achievement gaps. We might also be looking at AC we might be looking at the college for a report card that Mr. Bolo has shared with you last year, right? So there might be an array of metrics we're looking at and talking about instead of a singular data point. And we'll talk more about that as we can move through the process of the question. So I'll just end by saying, you know, it was a really good year for us from a continuous improvement standpoint. It's hard to believe it's only year two of our work, right, in terms of, of where we've been, we've grown as an organization, uh, and we look forward to continuing to grow.
I did attend the SWSA virtual meeting yesterday morning. Um, they did um, talk about, I guess there's like three areas surrounding this return to return to school um, voiced by many districts and superintendents. And one was the budget. We do expect that the state will have some adjustments to their budget, although with the election, it's probably not gonna be until after that point. And then it might not be an adjustment to this year, but the following year. Also, the other main concern is the spread of the virus. I mean, we all talk about we're going to go back, but we don't know what's happening with that. We have to pay really close attention to that. And I know that Judy is working with our health department. It's good to hear that we are in touch with that kind of data. And then the other key area is the directives that may come from state agencies. We don't know what they might be having us do. And then you did mention the guidelines are coming out. So um, some other legislative issues that kind of came up among the discussion was some districts are questioning the delay of the school start date. Um, I don't think that we're doing that, but that is a concern out there. Probably, it probably depends on the spread of the virus. So there was concern about that. And also hours of instruction, uh, you mentioned that, that that also could be impacted. Some also talked about um, having teachers come back and different um, concerns about licensing teachers, if, there, if, if there's a shortage. So there's a lot of stuff on the radar. And that's what I really like about this group, this SWSA, because you get a lot of different perspectives and districts of our size and not our size. And it's just a good group to be part of. And that's kind of what um, they, we discussed. about attempting new things during this virtual learning and uh, they enjoyed being innovative and creative and their biggest reflection um, was that they got to know their students better and um, meeting one-on-one -on -one, um, really helped them with their social emotional needs um, and, and that was the biggest takeaway and regarding um, Actually, that's the end of that. And then I met with um, one of my um, curriculum and assessment liaison uh, with Dr. Werder and Dr. Cohen. And um, they, um, we talked about the reports that, um, that Dr. Cohen gave tonight. And um, as the board recalls, back in November of 2019, we approved uh, new courses for science curriculum, curriculum and programming and courses for world language and music. And during that time, uh, with our during this time with our virtual environment, teaching and learning uh, was able to build some products for that course development, and they're ahead of their work. And they have uh, the entire elementary and science programming built out. Half of the middle school science programming is done. The high school changes to existing course courses is two thirds done. And the plan for the music department coursework was built out through the summer uh, with new will be built out during the summer with Ms. Sundrum. Is that all correct? Okay. And uh, the team will continue to work throughout the summer, uh, either in person or virtually if they have to, on all the course development um, that we approved. And then we heard about uh, summer, a little summer school. Um, we had many of the same instructors at the high school for the remedial summer school. Uh, which is highly recommended for the credit recovery and then for the K-8. A survey uh, regarding moving forward was with virtual summer school was sent out and they was, the district received um, 1,250 1, responses and it was a 50-50 split on whether we should uh, have the summer school. And um, 
in moving forward in programming, the hands-on and athletic classes were eliminated. Daily schedules will be mandatory for all grade levels so that children would be engaged for approximately 45 to 60 minutes. And then we will have quality programming, of course, and it will follow the DCI summer school guidelines. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Gabson, for attending the whole meeting.